All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining. We're going to go give it about a minute or so for folks to dial in, and then we will kick off. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Diana, and I am the Global Blockchain Business Council's Head of Research and Sustainability. It's my pleasure to introduce you and welcome you to the GBBC's Virtual Members Forum today on growing global requirements on the battery value chain. This is a biweekly webinar showcasing the innovative work of our members around the world. And today we are pleased to be joined by Doug Johnson Pengson from Circular. Industries are facing unprecedented challenges in supply chain vulnerability, which is real. Consumer demand is changing and investors require proof of the ESG claims that organizations report. On top of this, global regulations are requiring organizations to revise their strategies. Circular offers a software solution that enables its customers to track raw materials through industrial supply chains to demonstrate responsible sources and sustainability while meeting the needs of global regulation. Join us as co-founder and CEO Doug Johnson Pungson walks us through the value chain that end-to-end -end supply chain transparency delivers and shares insights on how key industry players comply with global regulations. Just briefly, before we begin, I would like to introduce Doug. Doug Johnson Pungson is the founder and CEO of Circular, which is an organization that enables manufacturers to trace their supply chain in order to ensure responsible sourcing, sustainable production, and effective recycling and reverse logistics. Doug has 25 years of international experience working in both leadership roles for large corporations, as well as starting and growing companies. We welcome your questions at any point during today's presentation so please submit them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will take them after the presentation. Thank you, Doug, for joining us. And I will now think, turn things over to you to begin. Thank you very much, Diana. And um, thank you also for the opportunity to, to talk. I'm going to share my screen, so hopefully you can, you can see that. Um, as, as Diana mentioned, I'm going to be talking about um, batteries particularly ev batteries and you might be wondering why we're all listening to something about batteries but batteries are the first example of a product passport um, you may have heard of the term of product passport the fashion industry is talking about them and and there are there are now sort of um there's a growing movement to recognize that not only does a product have a story whether that's around responsible or sustainable business or potentially to encourage the circularity of that product. We could be talking about plastic bottles, we could be talking about clothing, um, or in this case, obviously, I'm going to use the example of batteries. Now, one of the reasons why um, product passports um, are topical, uh, I'm going to unpack in the course of this, is that obviously in Europe, we have European battery regulations, which are going to come into force in a couple of years. And about two weeks ago, President Biden signed into law the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, which amongst many other things, also includes an EV tax credit, um, which requires this too. So um, after this, we'll share a, a short white paper with, with people so that you've, and, and that'll be available from the GBBC as well, that will give you more information if it's interesting, but um, hopefully this, this will give a, a, a useful, interesting taster to, to, to this topic. Now, as Diana mentioned, there are a number of drivers um, that, that are um, encouraging greater 
uh, understanding of what a manufacturer inherits from their supply chain. First of all, us as consumers clearly don't think that it's acceptable to buy a shiny new electric vehicle when there might be concerns about child labor within the supply chain, particularly for materials like cobalt, which are essential ingredients of lithium ion batteries. You know, two thirds of the world's cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where there are concerns around uncontrolled artisanal mining, including with children. Those sorts of things consumers care about. But we could just as easily be talking about you know, forced labor in the cotton supply chain or other you know, uh, human rights or environmental concerns, whether it's deforestation or um, the use of natural resources and unsustainable you know, production of, 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 of materials that are used in the production products that we consume. So let's just unpack these very, very quickly. You know, supply chain vulnerability is obviously real. We've all become better informed since COVID about the fragility of global supply chains. You know, even as consumers, we were worrying about um, the availability of things like toilet rolls in the early days of the pandemic. But you know, something a little bit more serious than that, of course, has been the global semiconductor shortages, which are affecting you know, many industries, including the auto industry. Some of you will know that if you've ordered a new car recently, I appreciate that in, in the United States, most people buy cars that are already produced, but in Europe, people tend to pre-order them. And waiting times are now measured in many months, and for some brands now up to 18 months, a year and a half waiting times because of semiconductor shortages. I've touched on consumer demand, and that many brands are starting to realize that being able to demonstrate doing business sustainably is actually a driver of top line growth, that you can attract consumers to your brand if you're doing things responsibly. Patagonia has followed, the clothing brand has followed that mantra for a very long time, and so do car manufacturers, Volvo Cars, Polestar, very good examples of brands actively using you know, their credentials and proof of responsible and sustainable business as a driver of top line growth. But I'm going to focus a little bit on regulations and how that's starting to drive and accelerate behavior. Um, regulators have a role in signaling intent and then, you know, investors potentially follow that because they see that as a growing opportunity. So it's that I'm going to unpack a little bit. Then I'm going to talk about, um, you know, how does one actually gain this level of understanding and visibility of what's going on in the deeper tiers of supply chains? You know, obviously, this is the Global Blockchain Business Council. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the technology that's involved in doing that and the role of blockchain in this. Um, and then just give you an example of some of the, the companies that we're working with that are, that are working with this, and you'll recognize quite a few of the brands. So, you know, we've mentioned that there's a, a burgeoning amount of regulation focused on responsible business and on sustainability, and it's all over the world. Um, so, you know, for example, you have countries like Germany, Norway, Switzerland, putting into place um, supply chain laws which require brands that manufacture products to take responsibility for what happens in their supply chains, forced labor, deforestation, you know, excess water use, pollution. Um, and that's new and requires those brands to have a far clearer understanding of, of what it is that they, they are ultimately responsible for in the creation of a product. The European Commission is talking about um, the uh, Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, which would require all other countries in Europe to enact quite similar legislation. So that's around corporate responsibility. At the same time, you have the European battery regulations that not only require you to know where your batteries were manufactured and where all the raw materials came from, but also to be able to specify the carbon footprint of that battery in that electric vehicle um, per car, not per model, but per individual car. And that means that you need to know who touched what when all the way through the supply chain. The same thing is necessary for the EV tax credit underneath the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a second. So European battery regulations start to come into force in 2024. They will require proof of compliance around responsible sourcing, you know, proof of um, the you know, sustainability information of that battery, including a carbon footprint. You know, one of the levers to drive that, of course, is carbon border adjustment mechanisms, which is something that's been com contemplated not only in Europe, but also in North America, um, as well as proof of sustainable procurement. And all of that is then aggregated into a piece of information called a battery passport. The battery passport will, of course, describe the primary supply of raw materials into the battery, but this is also the start of a life of that battery. You know, the battery in its first use in a vehicle is the first step of the potential circular economy 
where at the end of its first life in a vehicle, that battery might go into a second life, such as an energy storage system, could be remanufactured and reused in another vehicle, or to go into recycling. And of course, you know, reuse, um, remanufacture, and recycling, you know, the three parts of the circular economy. But of course, each of those requires a greater investment, an incremental greater investment of more energy in order for that product to be in the circular economy and be, be reused in some, in some way. In the United States, the Inflation Reduction Act, which has just come into force, is looking to try and um, get more um, mining, refining, recycling and manufacturing done in the US. Why? A strategic over-reliance on China for critical raw materials. One of the first things that President Biden did when he came into office was sign um, an executive order around critical raw materials. And this is one of the consequences of, of that theme and focus on that strategic over-reliance. So geopolitics plays a part here. Suddenly, we're interested in where did the raw materials come from? Where were the mine sites? Are they responsible? Um, and how much value added was there to that material on its journey between rock and car? Um, and that there are two halves of the tax credit. One is where was the, where did the raw materials actually come from and have they come from free trade nations? And the other half is where was the work done? Where was most of the economic value added? And subject to meeting certain thresholds, that triggers the second half of the tax credit. So, you know, there's a very strong incentive now for some industries to start to understand their supply chains in a way that has never really been possible or existed before. So, so what are we doing? Well, we, we're about five years old. Um, and we've been working on this now for the whole of that time. We started off looking at problems like the responsible sourcing of cobalt, which means giving a, a, a digital identity to a physical commodity at a mine site, for example, in the Congo or an industrial mine site in Western Australia. And following that material on its journey all the way through the supply chain to the point at which it finds its way into an end product and attaching to that chain of custody information about you know, the actors involved, water use, you know, carbon emissions um, that can be attributed to it all the way through the supply chain. And that sort of granular um, primary ESG data is now increasingly you know, something that the financial community and commodity traders are looking to attach to the things, you know, to, to the financing and financial instruments that, 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 they, that they produce. Um, and there's a growing desire for consistency of ESG, uh, quality ESG reporting through, you know, not just supply chains, but from industries as a whole. So how does it work? Well, to create that chain of custody, you're looking to create a digital thread that follows the physical flow of material. Now, the complexity here, of course, is that what you dig out of the ground as rock is nothing like a car. And so that rock has to undergo processing and refining and amalgamation with other materials before it is used as an ingredient in the manufacture of a component, which is then part of a subassembly, in this case, a battery pack that ends up in a car. And so it's far more challenging than tracking food, for example, where a strawberry is a strawberry in the field and it's still a strawberry, but when it ends up on your fork. Um, here, of course, you have to be able to deal with those chemical and physical transformations. Um, and so, you know, first of all, you have to be able to create a reliable digital twin in all circumstances where material is mined, both artisanal mine sites and, uh, uh, and industrial mine sites. But then at every one of those processing steps, you have to be able to, if you like, code the chemistry. I often describe this as a cake recipe. You know, so much flour, so many eggs, so much sugar goes through a defined mixing process, spends an hour in the oven and comes out as one cake. If you made 20 cakes, you clearly added more ingredients from somewhere else that I didn't know about. And obviously only a TV chef can make a cake in two minutes. Um, but you stitch that together along the supply chain. You know who the actors are, you know, how much material passed through that supply chain. And you can also therefore attribute a slice of their scope one and two carbon emissions to the physical blob of material that found its way on this journey eventually into that car. What I'm describing to you is not theory. This is happening at scale now with car manufacturers all over the world. You know, today, if you were to buy a Volvo XC40 Recharge, their first battery electric vehicle, fully battery electric vehicle, you will get this kind of traceability for every one of the principal ingredients in that battery, not just to demonstrate responsible sourcing, but also to calculate a carbon emissions footprint. And Polestar, which is a spin out of Volvo, in its most recent sustainability report, you know, uh, claimed a 6% reduction in carbon footprint per car 
and in part, you know, gave some credit to to us circular in helping them do that because you can't manage something you can't measure. Now, what I've just talked about, of course, is rock to car, which is the primary supply of uh, the primary you know, supply and provenance of the raw materials from from you know, source to consumption. The circular economy, of course, requires the same data. Where is my asset? What is its state of health? You know, uh, if it, if it has undergone change, such as refurbishment or remanufacture, what happened there? And at the point at which it is scrapped and goes into recycling, you need to be able to demonstrate what proportion of product comes from recycled rather than virgin materials. So the same data needs to follow materials all the way through its life. And actually giving a product a story is an important part of actually also reusing it. Knowing what something is made of is very important to being able to use it after its first and intended use. Here's an example, and I mentioned some of these in the course of what I've been saying. Um, here's an example of, of some of the folks that we're doing this with at scale. And you can see a variety of car brands. Trafigura is, is one of the world's largest commodity traders. There's a whole variety of miners and refiners and others um, you know, in, in these global supply chains for batteries. LG Chem, CATL, you know, some of the world's largest battery producers. Um, Total Energies uh, was Total. We're doing things like, um, you know, helping them with um, uh, importing of critical minerals to demonstrate rules of origin. And also did a project last year on the chemical recycling of plastic waste as people experiment with how what I've described just now could be applied to completely different uh, different commodities at scale in order to be able to generate the sort of circular economy solutions that are necessary for us to use global natural resources more efficiently. Um, and sort of, you know, there are some brands now actively using the stories about what they're able to do with, with this kind of data to help them, um, you know, dis differentiate what they do from their competitors. Um, basically looking to to give um, to to give their uh, sustainability credentials credibility through third party neutral actors like us who are providing the data and proof behind those claims of doing things more sustainably and responsibly um, and in some cases like volvo actually directly seeing that tied to um to growth in 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 uh, car sales for example I'm going to pause there and, and hand back to Diana so we can do some Q&A. Thank you very much for your attention. As I say, we'll have, um, we'll have something that we can send out to, to folks afterwards if it's interesting. Um, and back to you, Diana. All right. Hello. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Doug, for your amazing presentation. We really appreciate you all sharing your insights, uh, sharing all your, all your insights as an amazing tech entrepreneur. Again, I'm Diana. I'm the head of research and sustainability at GBBC, and I'm going to take questions now. So first of all, Doug, um, what is Circular's vision for the future? And what do you hope to see culminate from the work that Circular is doing in the next decade looking forward? Yes, so um, I've, I obviously started at the beginning talking about product passports. I, I see product passports extending way beyond batteries. The reason, obviously, everyone's focused on batteries first, whether the purpose is, is you know, made in America or greater sustainability, mm -hmm. is that it's, you know, it's complex, it comes, it's a risky supply chain, the commodity is expensive, um, and it therefore deserves attention first. But I can mm -hmm. imagine that we will, you know, over the next decade, not, not we circular, but we society will want to see meaningful circularity applied to everything from the bottles that we use to you know the clothing potentially that we buy. And there are already companies focused, focusing on all sorts of different areas where product passports may pay a part. Carbon border adjustment mechanisms, I think, is a is a significant tool in encouraging you know local reuse, you know, more efficient use of resources and reuse of resources. Because fundamentally we're not going to make a difference if we don't use natural resources more wisely and that means extend their life or reuse them absolutely absolutely so what advice would you give any organization looking to revise their strategies to incorporate larger esg initiatives well you can't manage something you can't measure so the first thing you have to do is understand the the relative let's just stick with emissions for a second um mm -hmm. you know 
what contribution do you know what contribution do you inherit from your supply chain um, what is the total emissions profile of the products that you produce um, and actually clearly you need to be able to connect costs to emissions so you know the sort of data that we're, primary data that we're collecting is an input to cost emissions abatement curves that allow you to understand where are the quick wins where are the you know the greatest contribution you can make to reducing emissions at the most sensible cost obviously mm -hmm. it's a journey it's all very well to have a net zero commitment but you've got to st actually start doing something and and focusing on the lower cost elements of your supply chain where you can make a difference a meaningful difference without massive expenditure is important let me bring that to life in this context mm -hmm. i mentioned polestar when i was talking just now Mm -hmm. Polestar is reducing its carbon emissions by buying smarter. It's not buying anything else. It's just picking better suppliers in the supply chain based on this sort of information. They're going to buy the raw materials anyway. They're going to be buying the batteries. Actually understanding which participants in the lower tiers of their supply chain are contributing more to emissions and trying to find a way to you know, find alternative suppliers in the deeper tiers of the supply chain can make a material difference without spending any more money. Mm -hmm. now, Actually, that's pretty smart. Buy smarter is something anybody can do. Absolutely. That's, it's very simple. In many ways, it's not re reinventing the wheel, but sometimes the very simple um, aspects of, of how we run our organizations can make a big difference. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, the next question would be, what do you believe are the first steps that industries should take to combat supply chain vulnerabilities, as you've mentioned? Well, supply chain mapping is knowing what's in your supply chain is a good start. And that's mm -hmm. actually an awful lot harder than it sounds. Easy words to say. Most, most of the folks we work with have a very limited understanding of what's in their supply chains beyond tier one. You know, <laughs> traditionally, you know, the procurement department in, for example, an auto manufacturer would, would send out specifications and look for prices and is optimizing for quality and price and availability traditionally. Increasingly, you know, procurement departments are, are having to focus also on sustainability. And that mm -hmm. means that, that um, you know, responsible sourcing is a sort of a part of that as well. And so they are they're having to understand what's going on deeper in the supply chain. The concern, of course, is that a tier one supplier doesn't want to be either disintermediated or cost engineered um, because they obviously have margins to preserve as well. And so the sort of transparency that is necessary for you know, solutions like are coming to batteries mm -hmm. to apply to other supply chains has a, a, a whole variety of concerns mm -hmm. around how to get greater traceability without necessarily mm -hmm. complete transparency. Privacy preserving uh, technologies play a role there in enabling you know, a belief in the truth um, without necessarily complete transparency of what's going on within a supply chain. And, and actually that's something that you know, blockchain technologies can help with. You can, you can notarize transactions, you can timestamp them. You, know, you need ways of verifying the data that is, is um, you know, provided into a platform, which you can do with third party data sources as well as um, you know, things like business logic and tools to, to identify where people are telling the truth. Um, but you don't necessarily have to disclose it all. You just have to disclose the result further down the supply chain. And we, we're already doing that for carbon calculations. To calculate an attribution, you need to know what someone's scope one and two emissions are and what proportion of their product in a particular time slice went to a particular customer. Clearly, that is you know, commercially sensitive. You don't want your customer to know what proportion of their business you're responsible for. Um, so okay. there's, there's examples of this happening now, but fundamentally, you've got to be able to understand what, what, you are, what you are inheriting from your supply chain in order that you can start to manage it. Completely agreed. It's, it's about connecting the journeys of data in the right ways. And could you go into depth on how blockchain can improve the efficiency of, of these battery supply chains in, in any other aspects in, in specific so, to this industry? Um, so I, I, the blockchain, a blockchain is a part of the platform. So obviously the, the mechanism by which you create a digital twin has got nothing to do with the blockchain, the connection of the physical to the digital. You know, a, a blockchain, we could have a long debate about this anyway, but a blockchain is perhaps not the 
the most efficient store of very, very large amounts of production data. What it does do is enable you to notarize transactions and ensure that history can't be rewritten if it proves to be inconvenient, that, that benefit of immutability and obviously time stamping as well. Mm -hmm. um, much of the heavy lifting in terms of data storage is done in on our platform in Oracle databases. We use graph databases as a way of demonstrating complex relationships between participants. There's a whole variety of business logic that connects. I talked about code the chemistry, mm -hmm. that coding of the chemistry, the cake recipe is actually done in, in, um, in Oracle databases, not in, in the blockchain through smart contracts. Um, and, that's, and that's because as we experimented with how to bring this to life, it's often that you know, a combination of technologies used together make for a solution to a particular problem. And the problem we were looking at was how could I create a, a chain of custody? Um, but when, when you have such, you know, not only very globally distributed supply chains, but also enormous asymmetry in terms of access to technology and, and et cetera, et cetera, how do you make sure that you can trust the data that was entered? Um, and so there's a variety of things we've had to do, including making sure that people can't change records. Right. In addition, you've mentioned the challenges uh, usually seen in, in battery supply chains. To what extent is this also energy intensive? Hugely. So turning rock into you know, a car battery requires a massive investment of energy. So you know, first of all, the amount of useful metal that you get out of a mine site is a, a few percentage points of the total volume of the material that you're moving. You know, big industrial mine sites are massive operations with huge equipment moving very, very large amounts of rock. You know, explosive, explosives are extensively used in large scale mines, particularly open mining, um, sort of open cast mines. Uh, and of course, they generate quite a lot of carbon emissions. And that's just the first step. Then, of course, processing and refining that material into something you can use re requires a lot of energy. And if that energy isn't renewable energy, then clearly you are adding carbon emissions. There's a whole variety of um, work being done on you know, measuring the, the carbon intensity of making a battery, um, and it's significant. You, you Depend on, on where you charge your electric vehicle, you'd have to drive it for about 40 or 50,000 miles to have repaid the carbon cost of manufacturing the EV in the first place. Wow. It's much less in the Nordics, where there's a much higher proportion of renewable energy, and it's actually much more than that in the United States. Now, obviously, the total life cycle emissions of an electric vehicle are much, much lower than a traditional petrol or diesel car. So they are better for the planet, but they'll be an awful lot better for the planet if we manufacture them more sustainably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a good point that we often don't take into account when we assume that things are more energy efficient. Um, what about turning toward the tax credit process? Could you explain yeah. that process a little further? Yes. So there's two parts to the EV tax credit in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. The first part is that the critical materials, cobalt, manganese, lithium, etc., have to, uh, graphite have to come from a free trade nation. That means for the US, you know, Canada, Australia. Um, South Korea, you know, the, there are a number of there are a number of sources of you know responsible materials, um, and from a free trade nation. Um, obviously, a very large proportion of the materials don't come from free trade nations. So, to qualify for the tax credit, a, a minimum threshold the threshold changes over time. A minimum threshold has to be achieved of where the rock came from. Mm -hmm. um, and that's done by value, um, and that is possible. There, you know, you can buy your nickel from Australia, and you can get your cobalt from Canada, um, and, and you can meet the threshold today. Obviously, there's a finite supply of the stuff that people care about. The second half of the tax credit um, relates to where the economic value is added. You start with rock, it's worth a certain amount. And as it goes on its journey through processing and refining and eventually to battery manufacture and then to the car, obviously there's economic value added at each step. And what they're trying to do is make sure that, you know, the majority of the work was done in the United States. This, by the way, is very, very good because what, you know, it really fixates on electric vehicles and, you know, possibly sustainability and all the rest of it. But actually the whole point of these tax credits is to create jobs in the U.S. And so if you achieve a threshold of the, you know, mining, refining, recycling or manufacturing done within the United States, which, of course, is jobs, um, then you will get the second half of the tax credit. Now, 
today, nothing like enough of the work economic value added is done in the United States. So this is a significant incentive to create capacity and to create jobs within the United States that over the last 20 ish years, we've allowed to leach out into lower cost economies. So, you know, that it, it, it potentially heralds in not only a change that's good for the environment, but actually also quite good for the US economy. Absolutely. Now, I, I know this is, you know, political minefield if, if you're in the US. I'm obviously British. I, I, I don't have politics as far as the US is concerned. I'm simply describing it the way that I see it. And it's quite a clever approach because mm -hmm. an economic incentive you know, a strong economic incentive is sometimes better than a big stick of regulation, which is the approach that Europe has taken. Yeah, it can be more practical. Yeah. When we think about blockchains and implementation, which blockchains do you think have been most efficient for supporting supply chain traceability? And would enterprises cover the costs of gas fees, which can become an issue? Well, so... Um, we, we went through this journey um, and, and of course there are you know there are solutions do trying to do similar things to us that use different blockchain technologies now we've chosen hyperledger fabric which is obviously open source and and there aren't any gas fees um, and we we price to our customers uh, on, a, on the basis of usage-based pricing essentially you know enterprise subscriptions um, now you know there are other solutions there's there's you know one in the in the sort of well, there are a variety of solutions that are using things like Ethereum, which clearly do come with gas fees. And I think, you know, the concern there is, you know, is the price volatility in those, you know, underlying crypto coins something that materially affects the price of the service that is delivered to an end customer? Uh, and if it is, then I can see why that might be a barrier to adoption. Um, if it isn't, then it's potentially a barrier to good business for the company that's trying to deliver the service, i.e. someone like us. And it's one reason why you picked something like Hyperledger Fabric to do it. The other reason was that, you know, obviously when we started this business in 2017, we were at peak hype. Um, you know, the, the we were in ICO mania territory. Yeah. And, you know, my target customers were boring and traditional car manufacturers. And I didn't want to have a conversation about whether we, you know, how, how we'd raised money and whether ICOs were good or bad or all the rest of it. I thought the easiest way to avoid this is to go with something that is, considered as close to an enterprise enterprise class standard as you could find at the time, which mm -hmm. is why we went with Hyperledger Fabric. And obviously there's advantages and disadvantages to each of the blockchain technology platforms that could be used for something like this. We are constantly keeping our eyes open for what one might do differently. I mean, Microsoft, for example, has taken the approach to actually go in the direction of encrypted databases rather than a distributed ledger. Um, and so we're looking at the evolution of the landscape and thinking all the time about what's the most efficient way to achieve the business objective that we are trying to serve to customers. Absolutely. No, that's great. And finally, what comments would you have with respect to the geopolitical landscape, the role of China, the role of the US and any other particular regions that rise? So, you know, we, we've global supply chains sort of swing like most things like economies on, on a pendulum and we've swung towards global globalization and, and global supply chains and clearly through the current energy crisis the desire for greater resource security and energy security we're seeing the pendulum start to swing back the other way towards more localization mm -hmm. and obviously this is cyclical um you know right now you have uh, as a driver behind, for example, um, you know, European battery regulations, the desire for more local recycling. Yes, that's more sustainable, but it also keeps critical raw materials in Europe once they get there. Um, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act's EV tax credits clearly encouraging more to be done onshore in the US than, than, than at the moment there is the capacity to produce. Again, this mm. is part of that pendulum swinging. Um, and it's a natural cycle. I mean, we see pendulums in all sorts of industries where one sort of, you, you see this backwards and forwards around globalization to localization. And we have it in a whole variety of industries and you know, economies also follow cyclical patterns as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Doug, for joining us today. This has been a very thoughtful and engaging presentation and Q&A on Circular. We really look forward to learning more about Circular's progress 
And a recording of this presentation will be circulated to all those who registered and shared publicly on the GBBC's YouTube channel. Thank you everyone and have a great day.